Uh, we do come today, and I will try not to be uh, too long winded as we get into this today, uh, but we do come today uh, to a new sermon series. The new sermon series is called The Bible Out of Context, and today the theme is 1 Corinthians 13. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the most famous verses that we use, uh, things that maybe come out of weddings or graduations, things we say to make a point, but that we often only scratch the surface of what the Scripture is really telling us through these verses, and today uh, it's 1 Corinthians 13. Now I know already some of you are like, the Bible out of context, the real meaning. Pastor, are you about to ruin my wedding verse? Are you about to ruin? I got picture frames. I got all kinds of stuff. Don't ruin this for me, Pastor. And, and, and my, my goal here is not to ruin 1 Corinthians 14 or 13 for you, because yes, as you know, we put this verse on picture frames. There's always like a wedding. Yeah, bride and groom kissing. Love never fails. People get it tattooed on them. This is one of the verses that people love. And of course they love it. The language is beautiful. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It's poetry. The way that the writer, who is Paul, writes this set of scripture. The, the problem that I have with this verse is not that we use it for romantic reasons. It's, it's, a, it's a fine use of it. But I think it is a partial use of this verse. I think this verse means so much more. This verse 100% can teach us about how to love someone in a marriage. This can teach us how to love people around us. But it goes so far beyond hearts and flowers. And the problem that I have with this verse is, it is not, set of verses is not the verse itself. The verse itself, the verses are wonderful. The problem I actually have with this verse, you'll love this, it's the English language. The English language, in case you didn't know, big shocker here, the Bible, not written in English. We know this, right? So the English language has some limitations that other languages don't, and one of them is when it comes to how intense a word like love can be used. So I'll give you an example. You'll love this. Everyone get ready for your oohs and ahs. Ready? Here it goes, okay? So I would say, I love my wife. <laughs> Something a little less cute, though, with the same word, I would also say, I love pizza. Aww. Oh, there you go. I love my daughter. Aww. I also love the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. Yeah. Browns, Browns fans, Monday night, let's talk. All right? So these, this word love, in the English language, we use it to describe a wide variety of different emotions. The way I love my wife is different very much than the way I love pizza. The way I love my daughter is very different than the way I love the 49ers. The way I love my wife and daughter are even different in a nuanced way. This word love becomes a catch-all for these wide variety of, of different feelings that we share as people. We love our best friend, but if you love your best friend, that might cause problems, you know. Uh, we love doing yoga, and we love our mom. It's a very weird word, and the way we use it sometimes does not express the fullness of what the word is supposed to mean. So when we come to this scripture, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 1 through 13, we, we have to ask ourselves, okay, what is Paul really talking about when he talks about love here, this all-encompassing word, love? And I believe there is so much more to it than we often see. And we're going to break this down today uh, in two parts. And the first part, just ask this question, why the heck did Paul write this in, in the first place? If you know Paul from the Bible, you know, he, he got in with the Pharisees, he was standing around as Christians were murdered, and then he became like this writer of the whole New Testament, known for just giving people the, the deep, honest truth, and, and, and from our perspective often, in the middle of all this writing, you have this very flowery, beautiful, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy or boast sort of language that Paul shares. Well, Paul is writing to a church, the, the Corinthian church, and they're sort of in the middle of a fight that maybe you relate to. In fact, some of the lessons we've been sharing lately uh, uh, really already speak to this. 
They're having a fight about who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Who's got the most Jesus? That's a fight that people are still having today. There are churches around the country, well, they've got more Jesus than this other church, and we're better Christians than this group of Christians. We have these fights about who will be more loved in the kingdom of God. In fact, uh, I even used to sing a song in church. Looking back at it, it feels very weird. Uh, but the song was called The Lumber Song. And it was about this idea that every time you did a good thing for the Lord, another piece of lumber was sent to heaven for your mansion in heaven. So when you get up, God's going to say, this is all the lumber you sent. And you'll either have a, you know, a log cabin or a great big mansion. Like heaven is based on this idea of, well, you were good. But were you really good? Were you mansion good? Or do you live on like, uh, you know, the slums of heaven? Like you barely got through. This is the kind of argument they were having. In fact, even the disciples in Jesus' day said, who's going to have the best seat next to you in heaven, Jesus? Who's going to be right there, head of the table? They couldn't wait, even though they had been offered this gift of grace, even though they had been offered this love into God's kingdom, they couldn't wait to stack and prioritize who was going to get the best stuff. And as you get into the church of Acts, the church that, that Paul is, 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 is familiar with, uh, and a lot of people are talking about, they're starting to receive gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we've heard of these gifts, we talk about them at Pentecost mostly, but they were out healing people, they were out speaking in foreign tongues, they were out seeing and performing miracles, amazing things were happening, and so what did they start arguing about? Well, which gift is the best gift? Which gift shows that I'm really in favor with God? Because if God really loved you, he wants you to have the gift of tongues, right? No, no, if God really loves you, he wants you to have the gift of healing, right? If God really loves you, he wants you to have the gift of preaching, right? Those are the good ones, right? And so that's where we come to these verses. In fact, Paul would write in uh, the next chapter, the chapter right around this, uh, that God's various gifts are handed out everywhere. But they all originate in God's spirits. Uh, this is God's spirit. This comes from the message section of chapter 4. I messed that up. Don't mind me. But all kinds of gifts are handed out, but they are handed out by the same spirits to people. The variety is wonderful. There's wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing of the sick, miraculous acts, proclamations, distinguishing the same spirits, tongues and interpretation of tongues. He decides who gets what? So Paul is basically looking at these people who are comparing notes on who's got the best stuff. And he says to them, look, all these gifts come from God. They're, they're all wonderful. Don't get so caught up in this show me and show off version of your faith. Instead, recognize that we all have different gifts. All are doing different ministries. And God loves all of us. In particular, this Corinthian church became obsessed with the gift of tongues. Everybody wanted to talk in this holy language that had come across at Pentecost. Uh, in fact, this branch of Christianity, there's, there's still a branch of our modern Christianity that holds tightly to this idea that when the Spirit of God is upon you, you will speak in these different tongues. The tongues came at Pentecost. What church? is still very much uh, actively pursuing these gifts of the Holy Spirit? And apostle church, that's right. This is the kind of church where they're looking for signs and wonders to show that God is upon them. The Corinthians church is starting to say things like, if you can't speak in this God language, if you can't produce these signs and wonders and miracles, well, you must not be as tight with God as I am. Because I can do these things. You must not have as much Jesus as I do. Because I can do these things. And it, it, it becomes such an issue for them. It becomes such an issue with them. That Paul calls them out regularly in these uh, couple chapters. So here's, here's one of the ways he, he calls them out. This is from 2 Corinthians 14. So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking 
into the air. Paul is basically saying, look, your gifts of tongue, your, your God language that you're so excited about, if you're out there just speaking that language and people don't even know what you're saying, you might as well be talking to the air. This is the first century equivalent of Paul saying, dummy, you might as well be talking to the wall. No one's listening. No one cares. For my 80s and 90s kids in the room, it was a real, like, talk to the hand kind of moment, you know? He's basically saying, you can keep talking, but no one hears anything. No one's getting anything out of this. You're speaking to hear your own voice. And so when we get to 13, back in the 13, you know, this, this classic verse that we love so much, what are the things that Paul says now in context? If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship so that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Paul is saying, look, all you're showing off that you're doing, all these right things that you think you're doing, if you do them for the wrong reason, who cares? You're a noisy symbol. That's all you are. You're background noise in what God is doing. Your sound and fury, you signify nothing. You mean nothing to the greater kingdom because all you're really concerned about is making a show of yourself. In fact, it goes as far as to say, if this is how you treat the gifts that God has given you, not only, not only is your heart far from God, you're spiritually broke. You've got nothing left. You gave everything away to prove something. But you did it for the wrong reasons. And he goes on further to say, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, will pass away. We know in part, we prophesy in part. But completeness is coming, and when completeness comes, that part will disappear. That that is in part. Uh, again, uh, allow me to translate here. He's talking about the fullness of God's love. What we would call either the grace of Christ or the kingdom of heaven. And he says to them, look, you only know a portion. He's really blunt with them. We can't even tell because we're so distant from him. He's really blunt with them. He's like, you know a portion. You are talking about things way outside of your knowledge scope. And you're talking about them with authority. And you look dumb. You look dumb. You don't know what you're talking about. You think you're talking about the full terms of God, but you don't have a clue. And your great knowledge doesn't even scratch the surface. It's like you're looking in a dirty mirror and trying to describe what you see. You don't have a clue. And you need to know that. And this is the verse we read about weddings. This is what we read at weddings. Paul telling the Corinthians, you don't truly understand the greatness of the gifts that God has given you while you squabble and argue because you've forgotten that the grace of God comes from the love of Jesus Christ. He tells them they're missing love. Which leads us to the question that I started this with. The English language is weird. So what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Sorry, that's a joke for like 10 people. That's a joke for 10 people. But those 10 people love that joke. I laugh. As we discussed earlier, love can mean so many different things in our language. But, but the Greek and Hebrew languages were actually set up for different intensities of love. They would use different words. So some of the, the Greek words that you would use, eros, eros is, is what we might call lust. Eros was fiery, passionate love. You had philia, which was, is the root of Philadelphia. That's like brother love, family love. Ludus was a flirtatious kind of love that we might call like, you know, puppy love or whatever. Fifth graders, they, they have ludus together. Uh, there are other kinds of love. There's self-love. There's love between friends. There's all these different kinds of love that you share. Uh, and both Greek and Hebrew have these different intensities for how we love. But the word that's used in the Bible, in this section, in 1 Corinthians, the word that's used through most of the New Testament, it is a word that I'm sure some of you are familiar with. It's the word agape, or agape. So while there's all these other words for love, in fact, I even skipped one of my favorite ones, they would even use the word mania for love. Greek mania for love, that was like obsessive love, like, like just like stalker kind of love. That's not the love we're talking about. The love we're talking about is agape love. 
An agape love is the love to end all loves. It's a self-sacrificing love. It's a, I will give up everything I am so that this individual feels my love. The recipient of the love can be unworthy. They can be indifferent. They don't even have to know that they're receiving the love. The love is given anyway. It's the literal translation of the word love used in this chapter that says the best way to show love is not to be focused on yourself and your own needs, but the care of others. What do other people need? It's the love that Jesus gives to us. Agape love. It is the greatest form of love that is not self-seeking and prideful, but instead humble and all-encompassing. It's beyond commitment. It's beyond passion. It's everything. It's the sacrificial love of Christ. In fact, when you look at the scriptures that this word is used for, it changes the game for me personally. For God so agape the world that he gave his only son. That is the kind of love that Paul is talking about. When we say God is love, God is agape. We agape him because he first agape us. Agape shall cover all our sins. The self-sacrificing love of God shall cover all our sins. My new command is this. Agape each other as I have agape you. Greater agape. No one has this that he would lay down his life for his friends. This is the love that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. The love of God that transcends all of our understanding. This love that says, I love you so much. I will send my son to die for you so that you and I can have a right relationship forever. <coughs> love was not an emotion in Paul's writing. Love was an action, a state of being at all times. This is the love we share with the world. The love of God. That he would sacrifice even his son for you and for me. This is the love. So, so the next time you're, you're at a wedding and they read 1 Corinthians, of course, apply it to the bride and groom. They should have this self-sacrificing love. They should look out for the needs of the person across from them. But also remember, the ultimate pursuit of this love is this is the love that God gives us through Jesus Christ. We talked so much last week uh, about this communion table. We're about to come to communion now. This is love that Jesus would give of body and blood to cover our sins so that you and I could know the fullness of God's love. Let us pray. God, this day we, we remember love. We remember your sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We remember that you loved us before we could ever love you. Though we were unworthy, though we screw up and sin. Though some of us may be struggle to even admit that we need you in our lives, you love us anyway. So, so God, we ask you this day, fill us with your love. But let it not be a, a light love, a superficial love. Let it not be a love that's based in works and wonders and trying to prove who's best. But let it be a love that's based in your word, knowing you are great. We love all of us. And you gave the ultimate sacrifice for our care. We pray this day that we will know this kind of love. Amen. <coughs> Church.